In this video, we're going to discuss the life cycle energy analysis of cast iron and aluminum cylinder blocks. And the basic idea of aluminum cylinder blocks is that the lower weight will use less fuel during the life of the vehicle on the road. And that's true. But the production of aluminum requires a lot more energy than cast iron. So if we want to evaluate the true benefit to society, we have to look at the life cycle and not just the tailpipe. And this work is based on research conducted at Cranfield University in the UK, where seven students collaborated on a master's program. And they did it by literature review and also by surveying of different manufacturing in the industry. Um, if we begin with the primary production, and this is the value found by the students at Cranfield, but it's quite consistent throughout the literature. The production of primary aluminum requires approximately 98 gigajoules per ton, and the production of primary pig iron approximately 17. Yeah? And somehow, during the life of the components, we have to pay back this energy differential in, a, in, in terms of the energy saved during use. But of course, we don't use primary aluminum for engine blocks. There is some primary aluminum added, but it's primarily recycled aluminum. So in this study, the students assumed infinite recycling of aluminum to provide the best case scenario. And cast iron is, of course, also recycled. So we also took the values, the decay and the original energy as a function of each recycling loop. Yeah. And from this point, the students made a survey of different manufacturers. So on the iron side, and the Tupi foundry in Brazil and in Mexico, plus the Fritz Winter, Eisenwerk Brühl, and Halberg foundries in Germany all participated in the study, offering up their production data. And on the aluminum side, it was NEMAC and Texied. So I think for the Western world, it was well more than half of the engine block production. So it's very representative data. Um, in this overhead, the students broke down the energy consumption for each step of the foundry process. And you can see that for cast iron from uh, melting, um, holding, the casting, the sand for the green sand and the, and the core making, uh, fettling and machining. Typically, there was an average of about 13.1 gigajoules per ton of cylinder blocks. On the aluminum side, the range was much higher. And this depends on the type of production. So whether it is high pressure die casting, where we don't have any sand, or low pressure die casting, where we have some sand cores, and then finally sand casting, where there's quite a lot of sand used. So the melting energy for aluminum was quite low for high pressure die casting. It was higher for um, sand casting. The holding was also higher. For sand casting, the holding was up to 13 hours to allow impurities to settle. So that's the reason for the higher energy content. And then also a big difference in the sand, whether for high pressure die casting, no sand, or for sand casting, um, producing the casting entirely in a resin bonded core package. So for aluminum, ranging from approximately 25 to 60 gigajoules per ton of cylinder blocks. Yeah? And we can break this energy down into two different types of energy. So first we have the material energy. This is all of the energy in the raw materials like the primary aluminum, the recycled aluminum, the iron scrap, the sand, the resin that's used in the sand. And in this study, the students included all alloying elements that were more than 1% of the metal. So for example, ferrosilicon for the cast iron side. Yeah. And we see for high pressure die casting, for low pressure die casting, for sand casting, and for cast iron, the accumulation of the material energy at per ton of cylinder blocks. We can then do the same thing for the process energy. So this is now the energy required for melting or for holding or for mixing the sand or for squeezing the sand. And again, it's broken down for each of the different elements for high pressure die casting, low pressure die casting, sand casting, and finally cast iron casting. To get the total energy then, we simply add together the material energy and the process energy. And you can start to see where the study goes. Somehow, the difference between the amount of energy in the aluminum production and the amount of energy in the cast iron production has to be recovered by using less fuel 
during the life of the vehicle? And that's the question. Is it ever recovered? Um, so we can now convert from the energy per ton of cylinder blocks to the energy for each cylinder block because, of course, the aluminum cylinder blocks are lighter, so we have fewer of them, uh, or sorry, we have more aluminum engine blocks per ton. And in this plot, then, for high pressure die casting, um, low pressure die casting, sand casting, we have the energy in megajoules for each cylinder block for a diesel engine and also on this side for a petrol engine. Yeah? And at the bottom we see this delta in the energy. So the difference between 2,477 and 1,238 is this value. And this is the amount of energy that we have to recover by using less fuel on the road over the life of the vehicle yeah, to make the break even. Um, what I've done in this calculation is to also include the grams of CO2 for each kilogram, uh, sorry, the kilograms of CO2 for each kilogram of cylinder block material. So according to the International Aluminum Institute, the production of each kilogram of primary aluminum generates 11 kilograms of CO2. Yeah, and again, that is reduced by the infinite recycling or the assumption of infinite recycling of aluminum. And then during the manufacturing process, we put in more energy for the different materials and we put in more energy for the processes. So we build up again the CO2. And when we look, for example, at sand casting of aluminum, um, 9.8 kilograms of CO2 are generated for each kilogram of cylinder block material. And for cast iron, that number is 2.9. So somehow that difference in the CO2 has to be paid back by using less fuel on the road. Um, in order to make the calculation of break-even, we have to define the weight of the cylinder block. And we did a survey together with data from Ricardo and AVL. Um, and we identified the weight of a typical petrol engine cylinder block and diesel cylinder block. And for this study, the students used a 1.6 liter cylinder block because we reasoned that that's the most common uh, size in Europe today. Maybe in the future, the study should be re redone with a 1.2 liter cylinder block. And generally then, for petrol engine in gray cast iron, we identified 27 kilos as the weight. Um, in aluminum, 18 kilos for a difference of 9. And on the diesel side, you can see 38 kilos for the gray iron block, 27 for the aluminum for a difference of 11. Now, before this study was complete, and you remember back to our third video about engine benefits, we said that the cast iron engine can be shorter and everything else on the engine becomes shorter and lighter. So for the final calculation, we took account of that and we made two extra kilograms. So we said that in the petrol engine, it was seven kilograms lighter. Uh, the aluminum engine was seven kilograms lighter than the cast iron engine. And for diesel, it was nine kilograms lighter. And that's the weight that we used for the break-even calculation. Um, is that reasonable? Here we see um, two engines that won the Engine uh, of the Year Award back in 2016. There's the Ford 1.0 liter engine and the Volkswagen 1.0 liter engine. And what you can see in this is that the Ford engine is made in gray iron, the Volkswagen engine in aluminum. There's a very big difference in the weight of the cylinder blocks. The iron cylinder block is 26.7 kilograms. The aluminum cylinder block is half at just 13.3. But the total weight of the engine is only uh, nine kilos different, yeah? So I think that the values that we chose in this study, seven and nine kilograms, are quite representative. The other thing that you have to be careful about is that frequently iron engines are used for applications like transit vans, and aluminum engines are used in passenger cars. So there's a different duty cycle. And when we did the weight benchmark, we had to take that into account. Um, so finally, the data are presented like this. So we have high pressure die casting, um, for diesel and petrol, low pressure die casting and low pressure sand casting as a function of the number of recycling loops. So if the aluminum had only been used once, uh, this was the number of kilometers that had to be driven for break even. 
if it's been used three times, five times, or ultimately infinitely recycled. Yeah? And the black line is the average life of a vehicle in Europe. It's 214,000 kilometers, and that's based on the average of the EU 27 countries currently. And what it shows is that if you have high pressure die casting and you have a lot of recycling, um, you can pay back the upfront energy penalty during the life of the vehicle. It's easier to do it in petrol engines because petrol engines consume more fuel. It's more difficult to do it in diesel engines. But as we start to add sand into the aluminum casting process, particularly the cores because they're all resin bonded cores and resin is oil, it has a lot of energy content, then it becomes much more difficult to pay back before the end of the vehicle life. And certainly when we use sand casting, it never pays back. Um, if the life of a vehicle is 214,000 kilometers, it won't pay back in three or even four vehicle lifetimes. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have to consider the weight differential between iron and aluminum. So the intent is that the aluminum saves weight and saves fuel on the road, but in this example that we saw back in video three, yes, the Audi 3.0 liter V6 engine made in compacted graphite iron is 15 kilos lighter than the aluminum engine. So what's the meaning of the payback calculation? It never pays back. The calculation is moot. Um, it's a very powerful study. We have to ask this question. If you want more information, contact Sintercast.